So I'm Bhaskar Vira. Uh, I have been asked to chair this panel. The panel is um, going to look at decarbonization of the global economy. Um, the title being How to Decarbonize the Global Economy After Paris, which is uh, a small challenge, <laughs> uh, a major challenge, of course. Um, I'm assuming because you've come into this room, you've self-selected amongst the parallel sessions that are on offer, so you've got at least an interest in the subject and possibly a little bit of background knowledge as well. So we're hoping to conduct the panel as a conversation with not a lot of top-down presentation, a conversation between the people in the room. We will give you some background and I'll introduce the speakers in uh, a couple of minutes and uh, we can get started, but there'll be plenty of time for you to contribute and to share in the conversation. Um, Victoria sitting on my right looking at all the friendly faces in the room said it feels like a little bit like a conversation in the Gates common room and you should treat it exactly in that spirit. This is a conversation, it's not a top-down presentation. Let's talk about the challenges that decarbonization presents to the global economy and you've got a fantastic group of speakers so my, my job is hopefully going to be quite simple. I don't think you ever lack for uh, opportunities to comment. I hope you will join into that conversation. So. Um, and just by way of background, I work here in Cambridge at the Department of Geography. I direct a new interdisciplinary research institute in the university, which is called the Conservation Research Institute, based in the David Attenborough Building. Um, and we work a lot on uh, the intersection between human impacts on the environment and things that people are doing in order to protect nature and biodiversity. Um, so let me start by introducing our speakers uh, very briefly and uh, they, can, they can then make a start on their presentation. So our first speaker is going to be uh, Jana Antipas. She is a Gates Scholar, former Gates Scholar, and uh, is currently working as a sort of um, independent entrepreneur in the renewables and uh, energy sectors. She's going to set the scene very helpfully by telling us about what was agreed and what are the consequences of things that are being discussed at the global scale. What is the scale of the challenge? What do we need to do? Uh, so hopefully that will kind of bring us all up to speed. If people are interested in detail, there are two copies, two handouts, uh, two copies of her formal presentation floating around, so you can look at the detail uh, on that. Um, we'll follow with uh, Alan, Alan Smith Gillespie, who's Associate Director at the Carbon Trust, working with businesses, helping them to think about their transitions towards this new, brave new decarbonized world. Um, and we really look forward to hearing from you about that. And our final speaker is Victoria Herman, who's sitting on my right. She is doing a PhD in polar studies at the Scott Polar Research Institute, working a lot in the Arctic North, and will bring us a much more grounded perspective, both on the consequences as well as the sort of the expectations of uh, local communities and civil society in terms of uh, decarbonizing the economy. So as you can see, that's a sort of really nice spectrum of presentations. Uh, once they've finished with their introductory con uh, statements, I'm hoping that will open up lots of areas of questions. Uh, if you're feeling shy, I can try and warm you up, but I expect you won't be. So, Jana, shall we start with you? Yeah, thank you, Oscar. Uh, so, I'm delighted that we're talking about decarbonization, but why are we having this conversation? <coughs> This graph shows the evolution of global temperature relative to 1880 levels. And accounting for seasonal variations, the temperature has fluctuated between the red trend on top and the blue trend below, averaging the black dotted line in the middle. So it's going up. And in February 2016, exceeded one and a half degrees of temperature rise as compared to a limit of one and a half to two degrees maximum if we're to avoid catastrophic climate impacts. Why is this happening? This equation shows how greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel combustion and land use change are partitioned among the oceans the terrestrial system, and the atmosphere. As it were, we have created a source-sink imbalance. Anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions dramatically exceed oceanic and terrestrial uptake capacity. And therefore, they end up in the atmosphere. 
Surprisingly, in the tradelet, this is called an enhancement. It's a multi-gas problem, but CO2 is the single biggest contributor. This slide shows the steady increase in atmospheric CO2 concentration with striking results in the past four years alone. Significantly, atmospheric CO2 has surpassed the 400 parts per million threshold and is still going up. Whereas, in terms of climate impacts, it's critical for it to stay well under 450. Trend reversal, i.e. climate change mitigation, will require decarbonization. There's more than one way to a carbon-constrained, climate-stabilized future, but all such scenarios share some key features. Temperature rise stays under two degrees above pre-industrial, preferably one and a half. Atmospheric CO2 concentrations stay well under 450 parts per million. Emissions themselves, having been on the rise, peak and fall to zero or sub-zero levels by end of century, with a 40 to 70 percent reduction from a 2010 baseline already by mid-century. These are points of scientific and political consensus. Emissions can be expressed as a product of population per capita GDP, energy output per unit GDP, and emissions per unit energy, energy input, I should have said, per unit GDP, and emissions per unit energy. Uh, historically, population and economic growth, the first two terms, have driven emissions up. In future, the challenge is to maintain economic growth and simultaneously decrease emissions, i.e. decouple them from economic growth. The way to achieve this is to consume less energy per unit economic output, term three, and to emit less per unit of energy input, term four. And to emit less per unit of energy input is to decarbonize. The US, among others, has done this successfully, decoupling emissions from economic growth in the 2005 to 2007 time frame. Globally, who's doing what? On the left, I've stacked the top eight CO2 emissors and the rest of world balance by percentage share. On the right, I've done the same thing for GDP in two years, 2003 and 2013, 10 years apart, to see how roles have changed. Over that time period, the US and China emissions-wise role reversed. Although the US reduced its emissions, it maintained its number one wealth ranking. That is the clean growth paradigm. China also increased its economic output, but at the expense of also increasing emissions. That's emissions and economic coupling, not decoupling. So these are snapshots in time. What does our global emissions trajectory look like? Global greenhouse gas emissions remain on a business-as-usual trajectory, moving ever farther from the shaded target range of 40 to 70 percent reduction by 2050, associated with limiting temperature rise to below 2 degrees. I also cite here three possible pathways to goal attainment. 
these are scenarios of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And we can revisit them in more detail later if you like. But what I would stress now is that all require a historically unprecedented rate of CO2 intensity reduction. The G7, BRICS, and the world on average all remain far from the target zone, although the G7 has been accelerating its decarbonization. Uh, that's indicated at far left by the negative bar going more negative from one decade, 94 to 2013, to the next, 2004 to 2013. Guessing on track would imply rapid phase out of conventional fossil fuels and fast track scale up of clean technology. Uh, scenarios show over 60% clean energy by 2050, expanding to nearly or actually 100% by 2100. So, can humanity decarbonize our shared economy by the end of the 21st century? It's imperative. It's ambitious but possible. It's uncertain. Thank you. Thank you, Yana. I'm, I'm actually going to ask Alan to, to carry straight on, because I know what, you, what you're going to say follows really neatly from here. Um, there may be people who have specific technical questions to follow Yana's presentation. Can you just hold on to them? And we'll come back to them. Uh, once we open up the conversation. Alan. Uh, can we let up the, uh, thank you. I'll set you up. Thanks. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, following on from Jana's uh, presentation on the, uh, the, the science um, and pathways on decarbonization, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the way this needs to be done uh, and, and also a little bit more about the scale of the challenge. Um, I, I want to sort of wind back a little bit um, with, with, a, with a personal story. Um, about 20 years ago, I attended my first climate change conference. It was in September uh, 1994, so a little bit more than 20 years ago in Geneva. And it was laying the groundwork for the first conference of the parties um, in Bonn uh, a, a couple of years later. And a lot has changed in that time period, uh, as, as Jana has uh, alluded to. Uh, the world has actually increased carbon emissions by 40% since that time. Um, the world has warmed on average now by one degree. Uh, uh, last year was the first time the whole uh, world was on average a degree, uh, a a degree warmer. Um, and uh, developing countries have exceeded now developed countries as the major emitters. Um, and so, there is some reason to be pessimistic, but I'm actually personally quite optimistic, and I hope that what we could talk about later in the discussion is, is why I think uh, the world can decarbonize, decarbonize, and of course it must. Um, COP21 in Paris was, a, uh, I think, a momentous um, event. It was the first time that the world actually came together and agreed each country a series of plans of what they would do. And it's not perfect, but it has a framework of uh, a global agreement and a mechanism to review these plans on a yearly, on a sort of five yearly basis. Um, that was something that um, had failed to happen in Copenhagen, Copenhagen a few years ago, and it was something that the Kyoto Protocol, in a sense, was superseded because of the change in the makeup of, of emitters around the world, where in the Kyoto Protocol, pretty much developed countries were the one who had the commitments, and now the world has changed, it's vast, vastly different. Um, so to give a sense of the, of the scope of the challenge, um, I'll refer a little bit to the pathway, pathways that Jana uh, has mentioned. The world has to basically get to a net zero carbon emissions by the end of the century if we are to stay uh, below two degrees uh, Celsius warming. And that's the agreement of, um, of Paris. It actually says the agreement is to stay well below with 
uh, ideally an aim to uh, stay within about one and a half degrees uh, warming. And that only is going to take us to a 50% probability of avoiding some of the most severe impacts of climate change, which we'll hear a little bit more about later on. Um, and within the next, uh, the, the period actually between now and 2030, the next 10 to 15 years is going to be absolutely critical because it's the period that's going to set us on either on the right track or on the wrong track. If we get on the wrong track, we'll be locked in in terms of the investments we'll be making in our energy systems uh, and our infrastructure uh, to take us along a higher emission pathway. But if we get things right, we'll hopefully be going down the lower emission pathway. And what we need to do is to decarbonize, to actually reduce global carbon emissions by 40%. The same 40% that increased when I went to my first conference within the next 10 to 15 years, and do that when global energy demand is going to increase over that same period to 2030 by about 25%. Because economies need to grow, economies need to develop, uh, the global middle class is expected to double within that period, and of course, uh, with UN development goals, we need to make sure that we lift the world out of poverty as well. So development needs to happen. So the question is, how do you decarbonize the economy from carbon? Um, so uh, I'd like to talk about some of the, um, some of the, uh, some of the pathways, uh, building on what Yana said. Um, on, the, uh, on the technology side, um, renewables, of course, are very important. Carbon capture and storage is going to be an essential technology. The key thing, though, to remember is that actually um, energy efficiency, which is the, 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 uh, the, the, the uh, orange wedge here, is going to be absolutely essential. And that's actually something which uh, a lot of uh, 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 countries and companies can do now. So by, by 2030, in the next 10 to 15 years, we need to give at least equal importance to energy efficiency um, as to the deployment of renewable energy technologies. And I think the important thing to bear in mind is in that critical period of 10 to 15 years, we're not looking at incredibly new technologies. We actually need to use the technologies we have to hand today. We, there's no time to develop something completely out of this world. But as I'll refer to a little bit later on, there are some very interesting developments that will hopefully um, bring about those changes, which probably weren't imagined um, when, I, when I first uh, started um, looking at this area. Um, Power generation absolutely needs to be decarbonized. Um, uh, this actually shows the savings um, expected from the power sector between now and 2030. Uh, uh, a large proportion will actually come uh, from demand reduction. Uh, so end users of, ener of, of energy uh, not requiring so much through energy efficiency, as I've just mentioned. And then solar wind deployment uh, will be very important as part of uh, a significant increase in uh, renewable energy. Uh, nuclear, as it currently stands, needs to be part of the mix. Um, and carbon capture and storage, CCS, is going to be an essential technology uh, to put in place. Sticking with the power sector, one of the big uh, changes that needs to happen is to phase out coal, uh, the dirtiest form of power generation. That especially needs to happen in China and India, uh, especially given those two countries still have a long way to grow. Um, and of course, the US as well although the dynamics of the shale uh, and fracking uh, is actually changing the landscape completely. And, and interestingly enough, market forces are shutting down coal power plants in the US without any need for, for policy in that area. Um, uh, also, there will be a, a decarbonization, decarbonization required from coal um, through CCS uh, starting beyond uh, 2030. As you can see here, uh, solar and wind are going to be key areas of renewables that need to be deployed. Um, hydro. Um, needs to stay on track in terms of gradually expanding. And in terms of other sectors, uh, we've looked at power already, um, industry, transport, buildings, and uh, other transformation of, of, of energy um, are going to be key areas for, that need to be decarbonized. Those are really the end users of energy, so the demand side rather than the supply side of power generation. As you can see there, the, the, the orange shows how much of these savings need to come um, from energy efficiency. So energy efficiency is actually an important part of the technology portfolio that's going to be, uh, that, needs to be, uh, that needs to be rolled out. Um, and then um, also a switch to different sources of, of power uh, and electrification. So electrification of the, um, for example, light vehicles, you know, uh, electric vehicles, electric cars, and also move to biofuels uh, in areas such as transport. Um, 
And of course, we shouldn't uh, uh, forget that uh, the agriculture and land use is going to be an important um, uh, area of action to uh, mitigate carbon emissions. So energy, uh, carbon from energy use actually makes up about two thirds of uh, emissions. So it is the biggest area, single area. But um, forestry and agricultural systems will be very important, especially if there's any uncertainty around carbon capture and storage. So what this graph shows is um, the uh, emission, emission, uh, 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 emissions from carbon emissions from um, different areas, from different sectors uh, by 2030, 2050, and 2100. So this is the target by 2100. And from energy, with CCS, we're, we should be seeing actually a net, a net reduction in emissions. But if CCS doesn't work out, uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, energy systems won't decarbonize as expected. And a huge amount more effort is going to have to happen in terms of reforming um, agricultural systems and also making sure that we get afforestation and a complete stop to deforestation as well. So um, this, is, this is a huge challenge. Um, there's a, there's a, a lot of momentum in the system now towards higher energy, uh, sorry, higher carbon uh, systems and that needs to be changed. And what we need is something similar to the Apollo program a moonshot, the moonshot for the world, actually, and one consistently applied across countries. Um, so we need something like what took uh, our first humans to the, to the moon. The same level of coordination probably expanded multiple fold and across a number of different countries. Um, this is the same chap uh, about 40 or so years on. Um, and there's a bit of a mixed message there. Um, the, the, the one, one thing is we need a sustained effort. You know? This effort needs to happen not just in the 20, next 20, 30 years, but actually, sorry, 10 to 15 years, but actually sustained across further decades, although the, the next 10 years is going to be absolutely important. But the sort of the, 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 uh, the other kind of message from that is there are technologies available today that didn't exist when I started, when I went to my first conference. The internet ba barely existed. So the internet gave us Facebook. Right, but it can also give us a lot of very other interesting solutions. And I'd like to talk about some of the key drivers for decarbonization, the sort of things that will help us uh, get through the next 10 to 15 years, and also some of the things that will go beyond that. So the two main areas, one is around actually technology development and innovation, and the other is the enablers that will help make that happen and help make the transition happen. Um, like I mentioned earlier on, the things that are going to help uh, get us through the next 10 to 15 years is going to be existing technologies. So the key ones on renewables are going to be wind, especially offshore wind, where you can open up huge swathes of generation capacity that are harder to obtain on land. Uh, marine renewables more broadly, uh, wave and so forth. Um, and energy storage, which will be a key aspect of the system, especially for variable um, uh, generation technology. So for example, when it, the sun doesn't shine or the wind doesn't blow, you need energy storage to be able to um, uh, uh, save energy when it is happening and, and release it when you need it. So a lot of effort is going to have to happen in, in deploying these. Um, uh, many of these technologies are uh, on, on, on the cusp of maturity. But then beyond specific technologies, we're going to need system level innovation as well. And that's where it gets very exciting. So things like smart grids and networks, Things that weren't even imagined uh, maybe 10 years ago or more um, are enabled by internet, by the internet. Now we're on the cusp of the internet of things uh, uh, and, um, and that's going to be a key, a, key, a key driver. So actually integrating all these things together is going to be very, um, very promising, I think. And then carbon capture and storage, of course, is going to be a key technology, um, really needs to kick in. Um, after 2030, but the work needs to be done now and the investment needs to be done now to, get, to develop that. So I'll, I'll, I'll finish off with uh, what are the enablers? What do we need to make that happen? Um, we need money and a lot of money. So we need about $10 trillion uh, per year of investment across the various sectors that, that I talked about, uh, whether it's energy efficiency or renewable energy technology, development and deployment. And there's a role for public finance and a role for private finance as well. On the public side, uh, governments need to be there to take on the risk when there's uncertainty around technologies or around the commercialization of technologies. Um, so a large role uh, will be played by governments in terms of funding, the piloting, and the development of technologies. And a lot of uh, funding will have to come from private sources as well, 
Um, and a lot of innovation around finances, uh, financing will, will need to be important. So now we're starting to see the development of green bonds, climate bonds, innovative ways of channeling money um, from investors that uh, are attracted by the sector into um, the, uh, the companies and organizations that require financing and development of this. And regulation and policy will be very important. Um, as COP21 did, it sent a signal uh, to the world um, and it needs to keep on pushing. Um, carbon pricing is going to be very important. Um, it's going to be the sort of thing that will help establish parity uh, between renewable technologies and fossil fuel and carbon intensive um, uh, uh, technologies. And we need to see something at around uh, $200 per tonne of carbon by 2030 if we really we need, to, need to, to shift the needle on that in some form or other, whether it's taxation or whether it's cap and trade or energy, uh, sorry, um, uh, carbon trading schemes. We also need um, industrial policy and support for renewables. So governments have really pushed this um, and to understand that decarbonization has a lot of growth benefits as China is reaping at the moment, selling its technology abroad. Um, uh, in terms of, for example, wind and solar. Simple things that perhaps seem a little bit more mundane, but uh, efficiency standards. We saw energy efficiency a huge driver of decarbonization. Uh, we need things like higher efficiency standards in vehicles and appliances uh, and other energy using equipment. Uh, we also need to phase out uh, fossil fuel subsidies um, where, where they exist and then to continue ratchet ratcheting up the global ambition. We need to have the systems in place, which should be in place very soon, for monitoring, reporting, verification of carbon emissions at national level. And that we need to keep on reviewing that. So policy will play a very important role. So um, I am positive, but not complacent uh, on where we need to go. Uh, a lot of effort needs to go in. And it's certainly going to be incredibly multidisciplinary. Um, so m probably touches on a number of the subjects that you guys work on. I look forward to a bit more discussion on this and later thank on. You. Thank you. Um, and ask Victoria, who's our third speaker, to, um, to ground some of this for us. And uh, by that I mean, so Victoria works a lot in the um, Arctic North, uh, where the consequences of climate change are more than apparent already. There's sort of visible change which has taken place, which is impacting on lives, on species, and on the habitats in, in that area. Um, sometimes the climate change debate seems a little bit disconnected from the everyday lives of people, and I'm hoping that Victoria's presentation might help us to connect a little bit more and open up that conversation about uh, what next. Victoria. Great. Thanks. Um, so mine will be relatively brief in hopes that there'll be a lively discussion after, but I want to frame the question of how we decarbonize the global economy um, a bit more locally. So the two big points I want to drive home is one, that in order to transform the global economy, we have to transform local economies. And the second is that climate change is a human story. And we've heard a lot about large-scale policies and technology and business sectors, but we haven't really heard about the humans that are impacted by climate change um, and the ones that are going to have to be making these decisions. So the first, that the global economy is comprised of local economies and we'll have to transform those local economies um, I work a lot in Alaska, and Alaska is a big oil state. Um, a third of all jobs in Alaska um, are in the oil and natural gas sector. And over the past two years, the price of oil has dramatically decreased, and I'm sure if any of you drive, you can see that in how much it takes to fill your gas tank now. But that also means that the economy of Alaska is facing millions of dollars in budget shortfalls, which translates to less money for public school systems, for public health care, for the entire welfare state of every Alaskan. And when we look at that case study, that could be a possible future for transitioning from our current very oil-focused economy um, into a different economy as we're moving to new sectors. So in order to make that transition, in addition to what was presented about new technologies, we also need to look at policies that will revitalize local economies to ensure that we are creating different jobs for people who are currently employed in the sectors that we will be transitioning away from. You can see this a bit in current 
coal towns, particularly in the United States and in Canada, um, that now are kind of seen as the rust belts. So they have extremely high unemployment rates, um, and there hasn't been any large-scale welfare policies targeted towards them to make sure that their local economies um, aren't missed in this large-scale decarbonization uh, effort. So I would just say in the discussion that we're going to have not to forget that those local economies um, and the people who are employed in those local economies and go to schools and get their health care in those local economies are incredibly important in this conversation. And even if they're not at the table at COPS or they're not in Washington, D.C. or in London, um, that their lives will be impacted incredibly by whatever decisions we take to get to that 1.5 degrees or 2 degree limit that we've set for ourselves at COP21. And the second is that climate change is a human story. So by the end of this century, at least 400 towns and cities in the United States alone will be partially inundated and people will have to leave their homes because of how much carbon we've already committed. So that's the baseline of what we're working with. And again, a lot of those communities are in Alaska. Um, over a dozen communities in Alaska have already decided that they will need to relocate their entire town to a new area because of more extreme weather events that are eroding their shorelines, that are having their buildings literally fall into the ocean where they no longer have fresh water systems. Um, so that's, that's what we're working with today. That's, that's the baseline. So any decision, again, that we make to decarbonize the global economy will either exacerbate that depending on what path we take, um, and it'll exacerbate it on different timescales. So uh, when we're talking about energy efficiency and renewable energies, I, I agree that we can't, we can't just have one one pathway, we have to include them all, and it has to be very quickly. And like the other panelists said, I am optimistic, but also realistic that this may not happen as we we put it out in international climate negotiations. So again, too, I think that we have to remember that in addition to deploying renewable energy and new technology, we also have to make sure that we are equally investing in adaptation efforts, in relocation efforts, in loss and damage, um, to make sure that the communities that are already affected by climate change and will inevitably be affected in the next 10, 20, 30 years um, are being able to live not the lives that they once lived because our past decisions have eliminated that potential, um, but that they are able to live life to its fullest in their new locations, in their new reality, um, whether that's in places like Staten Island in New York City, um, whether it's up in the Arctic in Shishmaref, um, it's it's across not just the United States but across the world and. I would just say in our discussion that those two things to consider the local economy and investments in revitalization policy and welfare policy um, and investment in adaptation, relocation, and loss and damage policy um, are equally important in this kind of large scale plan to decarbonize the global economy. Um, so yeah, just to, to think about that and maybe if we could have a conversation that has those two parts in dialogue with one another rather than kind of siloing them as different issues because they are the same issue and I think too often they do get siloed like in in this panel for example the description is almost entirely about the global econ economy and decarbonizing it and it kind of misses the the local economy and the human aspect of it so if there is an opportunity to have those two in conversation with one another i think it would be a much richer conversation and i think i'll leave it at that and hopefully we'll have just under an hour to discuss Perfect. Thank you very much, Victoria. And I do agree that that brings those two parts of the conversation much more closely together. Um, we should clap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>